you might talk about using light and sound waves. Okay. Does this work? Okay. Can you please talk about using light and sound waves for disassociating water molecules? Okay. Uh, now, light has some value uh, for assisting in the energy of a reaction, but uh, sonic energy, I'm sorry, the, the type of, you're talking about for, are you talking about for resonance or just for aiding? For, for weakening the bonds on the water molecule. Weakening the bonds on the water molecule. Uh, I'm not going to say it can't be done because, I mean, for <laughs> anyone that says it can't be done, you can find a hundred ways to do it, okay? <laughs> but I haven't heard of anything like that. I've tried ultrasonic experiments. I've tried the lasers, and yeah, I, I'm aware of Stanley Meyer's work with the lasers. But he didn't do that to weaken the bonds. He actually used that to raise the energy level. Using LEDs at a different spectrum. Yeah, yeah, different spectrum LEDs. Yeah. So it's all about energy. Uh, when you're dealing with this this gas, if you build a system, plain Jane brute force electrolysis with with ducted cells, which means you're separating the hydrogen and oxygen, you're not making anything spectacular. You're making gas that is as, as basic as it can be, plain old parahydrogen. Okay. Something happens though when you use a common ducted cell, and um, this is what apparently uh, uh, Brown also wrote about, and that is that uh, if you design it right and operate it right, you can get up to 70% orthohydrogen and 30% parahydrogen out of the hydrogen content of that. Orthohydrogen is uh, doesn't look any different, <laughs> um, doesn't smell any different, but when you burn it it puts out twice as much energy as parahydrogen. So the gas is more energetic. In a resonance drive system, especially one where we're using ionics, ionics are involved, we're talking about high voltage fields. Uh, the gas comes out even more energetic. Uh, you also have monoatomic content. And the monoatomic content, oh, well, monoatoms can't exist in nature. No, normally they can't. But when they're highly ionized to the point that uh, they repel one another, they exist and they exist for a very long time until they lose that charge. Like charges repel. They're not gonna bond up, you know, join up and bond if they can't because they're being repelled. The more energetic gas you make, the less gas you need to get a given gain. Plain and simple. So if you're gonna build a system that's that's separating the gases because you think it's better and you're actually wasting more energy. It's less efficient in the production end of things, it's less efficient in that the gas produces less energetic. Let me get this right. You're saying orthohydrogen is better than parahydrogen? Parahydrogen, that's correct. Parahydrogen is more polar? Parahydrogen just means the direction of spin is opposite of that of orthohydrogen. In other words, orthohydrogen you've got more energy level within the, the, the atoms of the molecule storing more energy. It's, it's all to do with direction of spin. And as it decays, then it becomes parahydrogen. Loses energy, becomes parahydrogen. Just like monoatomic decays and becomes orthohydrogen, then it decays again and becomes parahydrogen. So, um, obviously, it's all about making the most energetic gas. How many people here have uh, heard of the Green Machine, Herman Anderson? Okay. Well, the Herman Anderson's machine, he didn't bother with uh, generating large volumes of gas. What he did was he just built a big drum, 13-inch uh, plates on 12-inch uh, piece of PVC pipe that he drilled and tapped and put screws in, and very crude arrangement. Had pretty wide space in between them three and a half inches of every call, three, three and a half inches between the two plates. And he just did plain brute force common duct electrolysis. He wasn't cared about how much gas he was producing. He was caring about the quality of gas he was producing. He took that gas, he exposed it to an ionic field. And he generated that using a high voltage uh, automotive coil that he had built to take it to a 70,000 volts. And he turned that gas, that uh, hydrogen in that gas, into deuterium gas, which, which contains a lot more energy 
than the standard hydrogen or ortho hydrogen. And uh, needless to say, since he was a physicist with the uh, U.S. government, nuclear physicist, he was allowed to do that, but he wasn't allowed to put that on any standard production automobile. You go a little bit further than that, and then you start making tritium. You know, we don't want to make that gas, that's radioactive. But yeah, it has more higher, higher energy level than even deuterium gas. But see, he found a different solution. He, he generated brute force, and then he energized the gas, made it stronger, so he needed less of it in order to run that engine. And by the way, he ran that engine on with hydrogen on demand from that system. Space shuttle. They use uh, tank hydrogen it's under pressure, liquid to be exact. Well, ortho hydrogen isn't so good when it's stored in liquid because as it decays, it becomes parahydrogen, gives off heat. And you don't want your liquid hydrogen to get hot on you, do you? So what do they do? They make sure that it's parahydrogen. They store it, you know, they pump down, store it. When they use it, though, they go through the process of converting that gas into ortho hydrogen prior to it getting to the, uh, the engines on, on that orbiter. They want to have that energy, that extra energy of burn that you get from that. And it takes relatively little energy to change the energetic state of hydrogen from para to ortho if you know how to do it right. And of course, their process is patented. I don't mean it's patented, it's also classified. So. <laughs> uh, anything else? So do you know what they did, how to do it? Yes, I do. <laughs> is it in a book? Probably. <laughs> probably, probably not. <laughs> probably. It's just, it's just in your head. What's that? It's just in your head. You didn't write it down. No, I didn't write that down. Oh man. There's quite a few people that, of course, work on that technology and are aware of it. But uh, I, I had a security clearance, and I'm told it's still binding, so I can't, uh, I can't divulge any information like that. I can tell you. <laughs> I can tell you. Okay. Uh, what else? Yeah, seriously. So. A series cell. Uh, look at the Patrick Kelly documents, gives you all the information, tells you what the difference is between a, a, a parallel cell, or a single cell, parallel cell, and a series cell. Um, online, uh, look for the D9, D9.p9, 